bench. I feel like a baseball, like shouter. Johnny Bench. At the bench. At the bench with Greg Platzer. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Another week? I have, I have fictitious named this morning. Oh? Yes. I got stuff going on, like in the educational realm. And they, they don't let, you know, the banks don't let you just open up an account if, unless you have some sort of fictitious name going. So the, the this is a... This is what is going on in my world. So your fictitious name is Stinky McGee, right? That is absolutely correct. See now That's it's right. in, yes. And your password spreading is spreading stink is, all over the world. The, and your password is this is my password, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, security is important. Yep, sharing with everybody. I just want to be transparent. Yeah, just don't share your own stuff with everybody. That's, <laughs> That's illegal. Yes. And offensive. And improper. Right, right. So what are you up to? Hey, you know what? We should talk about something. I was thinking about this uh, about six minutes ago. Yeah. Um, how a band, like how, so, how small business is important and how a band is like a small business. Absolutely. And uh, as, uh, as many of the, those watching know, I used to own a guitar shop called BCR Music in oh. Lemoyne. And I owned that for 27 years. And uh, for 10 years before that, I was a hairstylist. And um, that's, that's a tough business, hairstyling. Mm -hmm. um, because no matter how good you are, um, there's somebody that is either less expensive or more conveniently located than you. Yeah, so even if you're I learned, yeah, I, I learned in the 10 years that I did the hair thing at two different salons, I learned that how you treat every customer is important. And if you do your job right, then every customer, when they leave, will say three things. Number one, I'm glad I, I did business. Number two, I can't believe the value that I got for my dollar. Uh -huh. And number three, the next time I come back, I'm bringing so-and-so. Yes. And that is the critical one. And a band is the same way. Yes. Every time you step off stage, you want every audience member to go, I'm glad I came. Can't believe how good these guys were for the $5 cover. And the next time I come see this band, I'm bringing Uncle Ernie and and 15 other people because I want them to know about this as well. Yes. And so we can spend a lot of time saying what you should do, but let's spend some time saying what you should not do. Okay. All right. First off, if you need a manager, then you haven't been doing it right yet okay. because a manager is, is somebody that you want to have is somebody that, that will take what you've built and bring you to the next level. Um, I shouldn't say if you need a manager. I say if you start out going right to a manager. What everybody should do is, is with my store, I did everything but the books. My ex-wife was, was an accountant, and so she did the paperwork, and you don't want me doing paperwork. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about a successful store. But I swept the floor. I polished all the guitars. I... I, I I, I pulled the roots out of the sidewalk. I mean, I did everything. And, and as a result, as time went by and I could hire staff, the staff could do the things that I had already done, but I knew how to vacuum the floor because I had done it hundreds and hundreds of times before anybody else touched that vacuum. And with a band, what you need to do is you need to approach it like this. Being very, very talented is 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 a good is a good part of it playing together is a bigger part of it mm -hmm. and then giving a consistent performance at every show is critical absolutely and i think that a lot of bands uh i can't tell you how many times i'd go out and see a band on a thursday night there'd be six people in the audience and somebody'd say to me oh we're just going to go through the motions try some new shit out you know mm -hmm. whatever because you know there's nobody here and I was thinking, I would think, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. 
those six people deserve to be treated like it's Madison Square Garden. Absolutely. Because if those six people each bring another person back, you have at least 12 people at your next audience. And that's 60 bucks. That's the gas. Yes. So don't disrespect small crowds. Yes. Because you won't get the big crowds if you don't show small crowds respect. Yes. I have seen bands play little tiny rooms and blow me away. And I look around and I'm like, why am, why can I reach out and not touch somebody in this audience right now? And when I see that and I realize that what they're doing is they're giving their all, even though there's only a couple people, I want to support that. I want to be part of that. I want to be an evangelist. You want to see that, want to see that kind of person grow absolutely yeah yeah. absolutely absolutely here's a big thing and this is something i had to learn the hard way that one of the most important things you do when you're in a live band and you play in in clubs and and a lot of people don't think about this but the in between the sets what you want to do in between the sets is meet the people damn right okay because i didn't always do that you know what happened nothing yeah nothing happened those bands didn't do anything because i wasn't going out and 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 meeting the people that were showing up and 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 getting a uh having a a relationship with them okay uh you can't be introverted no no it's 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 not the business if you want to play for people you want to do this you can't be introverted you got to be a people person you got to deliver yes uh my girlfriend, Sarah Sheriff, who's a, a, a popular, I, I mention her every week, I think, and I'm going to continue to because she's awesome, Absolutely. but she's a guitar for hire. Yes. And um, she has played all kinds of venues. She's out in LA, she's down in Nashville, whatever. And she has the opportunity to meet people at all these venues that she would not have met otherwise. Mm-hmm. And she is building a network of people that might not be like, she might meet somebody at a, at a venue in Nashville and they might just be somebody that's on Facebook. But then the next time she's in Nashville, they might bring some people. And if she interacts with them and forms even the smallest of relations, Mm -hmm. then that person is going to say, my friend, Sarah is coming down from PA and she's going to be great. And we have to go see her. I don't care if Martina McBride's playing across town. I don't care if Luke Bryan's playing. You can see them anytime. You got to see this girl. And that's how you do it. It it's really, I'll tell you what, my dad, my dad, when I was six, my dad was an airline pilot and we had to go to an airport and pick up some paperwork at one point. And, uh, we stopped at a diner and the lady, the, the waitress came up and, and, and took our order and she walked away. And I, I said to my dad, do you know her dad? And he said, no, I don't. I said, will you talk to her? Like you've known her a long time. And he said, yeah. He said, because she's important to me and to you. And she needs to know that she's important. Do you think she got up this morning looking forward to taking our breakfast order? No. So, Do you think she's going to enjoy the interaction she's going to have with other people? And he said, watch how people treat her. And I sat there at six years old and I watched her walk up to the table with a big smile on her face and say, what can I get you? And, and people would do this with the newspaper. Well, um, just get me a number two and a coffee. Uh, And they wouldn't even look up. And I watched her accept that kind of treatment over and over and over. So when she came over to our table, she was beaming and my dad looked right at her and said thank you you know when she brought us stuff and she brought us i remember she filled my dad's coffee cup like three times because we were hanging out and then uh you know i got like a little extra something on my pancakes and you know or i can't remember what it was but there was something about it and when we left she said come back again and thank you for coming in and my dad said thank you for taking care of us and when we left i i realized that I had just been given one of the most important life lessons at six ever. years. Yeah. My dad flew all over the world and he said that it doesn't matter how insignificant somebody's job is, that is still a person. And that person mm-hmm. deserves mm-hmm. to be treated with respect. And you can bring that into the whole band thing. Mm-hmm. 
I used, I've worked in several recording studios. I've seen big shot artists come in, walk into the room and not even look at anybody, just, you know, sit down and get right to work. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I brought coffee in, into the studio to an artist and they wouldn't even look up or say, thank you. They would just hold out their hand and I would hand them the cup and they would go back to what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And when they would do that, I would walk away thinking next time he can get his own damn coffee. Right. And what I should have, you know, what, what he should have done was at least acknowledged me. And had he done that, I would have brought him all the coffee he wanted. Yeah. We all want to be liked. Yeah. And if you want your band to be liked, like the people that like your band, Yeah. go to yeah. these people, thank them for coming out because now granted in the late eighties, early nineties, when I was relevant, um, there were 10, 15, events going on on any given night whereas nowadays it's harder and harder to find live music but to that All point matter yeah to that point you need to be that much mm -hmm. kinder to your audience members because there are so many they could stay home and netflix and doordash you yeah. know they they could go over to uncle ernie's and drink beer and, and and throw sharp objects in the garage they get you know whatever and i have no idea where that came from and i don't have an uncle ernie so don't ask um, if you have an Uncle Ernie that throws sharp objects, yes. we want to know about it. What is this, this, this hatchet? Where did that come from? But the I point is that Jason guy. Yeah, little, I blame everything on Jason. Yeah. Um, but honestly, you, you gotta you gotta make it worth their while. More so, nobody's that good. I mean, hmm. honestly. Well, even the even the, okay, even the guys that. that we grew up with idolizing. Yeah. And then they're in their, they're in the autumn of their career right now. Oh yeah. Okay. So even, even them, I think they, they, they are realizing this. Yeah. Anybody that's still in it after the, the glory days. Yeah. They have to be a, a kind and considerate person with the exception yeah. of guys like Engve Malmsteen. Um, just but about everybody else is again, <laughs> And I'm not going to name drop, but I, I work for these people. Yeah. I work on their guitars. I'm, I'm around them. My friends are in the business, you know, so I'm constantly around famous people. And um, there's very few people that are still out there playing. It's, it's, well, okay. Let's, let's take into account uh, Dana Strum. Uh, right. I just fixed his bass. If you look on Greg Platzer guitars on Facebook or Instagram, you'll see the work I did on his bass. Dana will play let's say tonight slaughter plays and they might play to 250 to 400 people in a, in a venue that I might play. You might play rod. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're not doing stadiums anymore. You know, they're the thing is Dana is the guy that introduced Randy Rhodes to Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, Dana changed. Well, modern he introduced hard a lot rock. Of, he, yeah. A lot of Ozzy's yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's and, like a, and, almost like a and, he's, scout. and he's Vince Neal's personal manager. Okay. And so, you know, Dana has every right to be an arrogant prick. Dana's a sweetheart. Yeah. Dana and I, in fact, when I, when I, they were uh, playing in Atlantic city at the rivers casino and I went over to pick up some guitars and they had a room for me and everything, which was very nice. And they transported me around, which was very nice. But Dana and I, I sat down, uh, Dana, Jeff Blando, Mark Slaughter, myself, we sat down and had dinner and I, I couldn't believe just how genuine this guy was. I've, I've dealt with him on and off, but to sit down and, and you know, one-on-one, -on -one, what a splendid guy. And Jeff Blando, the guitar player, uh, is nuts. And he's a lot like me. We're both kind of nuts. And we just decided that Dana, uh, Dana was ordering and he was arranging things and he emails everybody, you know, like the schedule and what time you have to be where and everything. And we decided Dana is our dad. And so we call him dad and he calls us son. And it's, it's funny. And to think that a man that was so pivotal to modern rock and roll by, by getting a guitar teacher that was playing in a club band hooked up with one of the greatest front men of all time oh, yeah. and basically changing hard rock. And to some extent, guitar playing as well, because Randy brought the neoclassic thing up, up um, to a much bigger level than that other guy. And uh, um, Randy was just a genius. He was a melodic genius. And he brought so much to the world. And if, if it wasn't for Dana, 
And Dana could walk around swinging his balls going, yeah, I, you know, that's who I am. No, Dana's just dude. He's mm -hmm. just, dude. and um, he treated me very, very well. And he got a loyal, uh, a, a very loyal person. And if Dana needs something worked on, I'm going to work on it for him. Yeah. And uh, if Dana needs a connection, Dana's, you know, like he's booking a tour and he's like, Hey, can you hook me up with some crew members in this town or, or, you know, do you know a road manager that can fill in or, you know, whatever I'm going to do what I can for him. Yes. Um, another guy wanna, is uh, that, all, this, all this matters. All this is like people will rally behind somebody who's not an asshat. Like, absolutely. It's energy. Absolutely. It is absolutely. Energy. Yeah, it's absolutely and, energy. And it's like, we're in the industry. We're in the energy industry. It's like, we, well, don't, remember, have, we don't have wings. Yeah. Nothing's going to happen. When I was in high school, the football players were gods and could do anything. Mm -hmm. And the cheerleaders were goddesses and could do anything. And I can remember, I got along with just about everybody in high school because I didn't fit into any particular group. And in fact, my band played at dances and stuff. So there were times when basically I might have been construed as one of those people that you know and i i can't tell you how many times i would be in conversation with somebody and then somebody else would walk by and the person i was conversing with would completely ignore a friendly greeting or something like that and i would look at that like wow you know who the hell are you and when i got to the point where i was working with celebrities a lot um i i noticed that when you get those people um they tend to be very very lonely and the people that are kind uh tend to have a whole lot of really cool people around them mm -hmm. and if, if you played twenty thousand seat stadiums and now you're playing a 400 seat club and you still do that show you still make every you make eye connection with everybody in the audience and you you do the absolute best you can and and even though you've played a song 5,000 times, it feels like this is the absolute best way you can deliver it. Yeah. Then everybody in that audience knows it. And all of those people become evangelists because let's be honest, people expect you to fail. Um, I'd say half the people that go to NASCAR races just want to see a crash. Yeah. Well, and, and hockey. And ho oh, my, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we go to Hershey to, to watch the fights and occasionally they knock a puck around. And the, the, the whole thing is you have a responsibility as a musician to be more than just really good at playing guitar, bass, drums, keyboards. That doesn't, yeah, that, that is, that is actually pretty, I don't think it's not low, low on a list, but it's, as I said, nobody will show up just for that. No, no. I, I taught guitar for, for many years. And I remember there was a kid, um, that was a Gettysburg. I, I grew up in Gettysburg and uh, he was a Gettysburg high school senior. And his band played at uh, a talent show. And this kid, his name was Alex. Can't remember his last name. And I wouldn't tell you if I knew it. But he was into jazz guitar. And his jazz trio got up and played. Uh, and they played. And there was polite applause. And then the next lesson, he comes up to me. And I said, well, I was there. And I said, you guys played really well together. And he goes, yeah. He said, but nobody clapped after the solos. And I thought, who cares? That's not why you get up there. If, you know, if you want people to clap after the solos, maybe you need to find another line of work. Um, or another you know, style of music. <laughs> you know what? If you're the guitar player, make the bass player look good. If you're the bass player, make the drummer look good. Yeah. And everybody, of course, has to make the lead singer look good. Yeah. You know, how many uh, how many lead singers does it take to change a light bulb? All right, go ahead. None. <laughs> he holds the light bulb up and the world revolves around him. That's wonderful. <laughs> How many guitar players does it take to change a light bulb? Same answer. No, 97. <laughs> All right. One to do it in 96 to say, not bad, but I'm faster, louder, and my hair looks better. I can do it, yeah. How many bass players does it take to change a light bulb? Go ahead. Rody. <laughs> How many drummers does it take to change a light bulb? Go ahead. What's a light bulb? <laughs> I'm going sorry to drummers it. well drummers are like musicians except they have a lot more stuff yeah um i was yeah, in a band called citizen kane in the late 80s early 90s and uh, uh 
the uh, the the drummer, the other guitar player was a nefarious bastard, and he decided that he wanted to replace our drummer, and so we had auditions, and um, we had a drummer show up, and he was really really good, and and, and we were rehearsing in Dillsburg, PA, which is south of Harrisburg, yeah. and yeah. Uh, the guy came, drove down from. I don't know, Countersport up near the New York border, like three hours away. And he showed up in a Fiat X19. And uh, we, we, we thought, wow, this guy's a really good drummer. And we said, all right, so um, if we decide to go with you, well, Eddie said this, I was kind of a passenger in this. He said, if we decide to go with you, then you know we, we rehearse five nights a week and we play two nights a week at least. Um, so basically every night, and the guy said, well, somebody's going to have to drive up and get my drums. I said, what? I said, well, you know, I have a Fiat X19, a little two-seat Italian car. He said, I can't carry my drums on my thing. And I, I just said, man, I, out of a gig. I, I just I, I just went like that. I said, boom, you're, I, I'm not doing it. I'm not driving to Cowdersport to get your drums. If, if you're a drummer, get a van. I mean, I drive a Honda minivan. I've always had vehicles that had a hatch either station bag station wagon or volkswagen gtis take the back seat out i could carry a marshall stack three les pauls and a pedal board mm -hmm. um but with my minivan i can carry just about everything and uh if you don't care enough, people a reason not to not not to want you in yeah yeah the worst thing there's so many reasons to not do business with somebody why give yeah. them a reason and i've said yeah. that before and i'm going to continue to say that yeah but yeah. your band is a small business um being good, being innovative, being interesting, being connected, being tight, uh, being uh, um, being connected with each other. That's all very important, but don't let it, don't think that because you are the next Van Halen or Duran Duran or Oingo Boingo or, yeah. you know, whatever, don't think that anybody's going to give a shit. Yeah. I have a really good friend whose name I'm not going to tell you who uh, is in a, he's a guitar player in a country band and they've had a whole bunch of number ones, an absolute shit ton of number one songs. And he says, I'm not the best guitar player in Nashville, but I'm one of the nicest. And he really is a, a splendid guy and he would drop everything for you. He actually is a tremendous guitar player too, but that is the secret right there is. All right. When I was in college, we opened up for the Greg Kin band, and and uh, everybody's like Greg Kin band. Who are they? they did yeah, a. They don't write them like that anymore. Yeah, uh, 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 the guy was a one-hit wonder. That's that's two to it. And uh, actually, no, he did two songs. He did Your Love, love is in Jeopardy, Jeopardy too. baby. All right, this guy was a horse's ass, and um, his road manager was worse. And know. the guy wore a beret, and I called him Frenchie, which was impolite but i was drunk all the time back then it was before i was sober and uh we played a show and they told us we had 22 minutes or 28 minutes and uh they only gave us red lights and one quarter of the sound and it it didn't matter how good we tried to be they were going to make us look bad and that that would make the headliner look better and um we ran a little over and they cut the power to the stage and you know granted we ran over but they made us look really bad um cut to modern day um i've done a bunch of work with a band called kiss that many of you might have heard of and i remember paul stanley saying very clearly that opening bands get whatever they want you know give them full sound give them a good light show don't give them the pyro don't give them the lasers and stuff but make the opening band look good mm -hmm. because kiss when they were starting out everybody they opened for treated them like shit yeah and you know that that you can't use the word success in the music industry without bringing up kiss and i recently read a book that was a bunch of interviews called from early crew members and record uh people and stuff like that and they talked about just how driven stanley and simmons were and how they were just nice to everybody now unfortunately gene doesn't need to be nice to anybody anymore even though he can be uh but Paul Stanley is, is easily one of the nicest mm -hmm. fellas in this industry, even today. Yeah. And in fact, watch his Dan Rather interview. It's, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's wonderful. And 
I, I would like to say that one of the things that contributed to, to their success was everybody that did business with them walked away feeling, wow, this was, this was nice. Yeah. And one of the, I, I'll tell you, and, and you're going to think I'm nuts, but there's a movie, <laughs> a terrible movie called Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. All right. And Jeff Healy. Yeah. And the premise of the movie is he's, he's a cooler. He, uh, bars would, have him come in and they're having all kinds of problems and he would basically turn the business around and make make a a, a crappy hole in the wall into a legit business all right and he comes into this bar and he's talking to the assembled staff and he he gives the best business advice of all time he says be nice he said somebody's having a bad day and they're, they're you know acting out or whatever and, and don't quote me on this but i'm paraphrasing he's be nice and, you know, if, if you know, get them to the door and then if you got to do something rough, then do something rough outside, but don't, don't have it inside. Just be nice to everybody because the, the patrons deserve respect. And, uh, and one of the bad guys says, I don't want to ruin the movie. One of the bad guys says, well, what if somebody says my mom's a whore and Patrick Swayze looks at him and says, is she? Is she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but be nice. Yeah, Just yeah. be nice. Yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, a bunch of years ago, I wrote Uncle Greg's Rules for Performance. All right. And what I'll do is um, I'll text them over to you, Rod, and maybe you could attach them to, yeah, this. to the, the description here. Uh, Another and, uh, thing is not be not for uh, band members to not be so quick to believe all the rock star stuff. Uh, like, and this yeah. goes along with everything we're saying. Okay. Um, Certainly, certainly your vibe and all that is important if you're in a rock band or whatever. Um, but work, still be always be working your craft, always try to improve yourself musically, not just not just your. Uh, you can't yeah. learn too much in yeah. life. Yeah, you cannot learn too much. I'm ravenous. I own every uh, every book on vintage guitars ever printed before the Internet. That's how you learned was, you know, somebody, I can remember when the only guitar magazine was guitar player and I couldn't wait till the 18th of the month when the issue yeah. arrived. And then I didn't do anything for a couple of days. And I read everything cover to cover, all the ads, everything. I was completely obsessed as a kid and that paid off yeah. huge to, to and get me to, you know, basically. People don't understand today. that, that those, those years, cause I have, I, I, I still collect them. I still have those magazines and people are like, you got to get rid of them. It's like, no. I have every guitar player magazine from 1967 to about three years ago. Okay. I have every guitar for the practicing musician. I have yeah. every guitar world. I have uh, rock scene yeah. as a great magazine circus. I have, I mean, I got, uh, no, I'm an addict. I'm, I've been sober 37 years, but um, I still have, you know, addictive tendencies and addictive. One of the addictive tendencies that, that I suffer with is collecting. Um, I'm going to move this around now. I, I collect tools and there's a lot of tools in this place. And um, that's, that's a good thing. That's, you know, that's when my addiction actually benefits me. And I collect knowledge yeah. about, uh, about guitars. And um, just this week, in fact, uh, if you go to YouTube, a factory tour uh, of the Gibson factory from 1967 popped up on the internet. Oh, right. And it's on YouTube. It's really cool to see how they made guitars in 1967. Mm -hmm. um, it's before Gibson really kind of started declining. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's really kind of interesting. And I've watched that video five times already. And and it's it's brought up even more questions for me. And I know uh, and this is somebody who has studied Gibson guitars his whole life. Yeah, I'm I, yeah, I'm I'm obsessed with vintage Gibsons. Yeah. I'm absolutely obsessed with it. The new stuff can be good, but in the late 50s, this country was in an interesting place. All right. The war was, you know, 10, 15 years in the past, and everything was prosperous. And in, in the 50s, the guitar companies stumbled on basically the right recipe. Uh Fender had the Stratocaster, the Telecaster. Um, the precision bass, which changed everything. Gibson had the Les Paul, the 335, the 175. Um, uh, Fender had their their amazing amps. Um, you know, you had Gretsch guitars, which were which were 
different and mm -hmm. Martin acoustics and Gibson. I still like Gibson acoustics better than Martin's when it comes to old ones mm -hmm. and cars were cool, you know, and it was just, I, I sometimes wish I lived back then. Um, the late fifties would have been a great time, except women's rights were, were non-existent. Women, women were still property back then. And that's yeah. very wrong, Civil but rights. For, for style and for, uh, you know, for design on, on guitars, motorcycles. I mean, Harley was making some crazy cool motorcycles. Triumph was coming about BSA Norton mm -hmm. and there was just neat stuff going on. And, uh, nowadays almost every company that's still existing from that era just makes copies of the stuff that they did back then yeah um i was gonna say because, most of the prototypical gibsons and you you tell me if i'm wrong they had their origins in the 50s yeah 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 you have even the like we have the the last paul we have the flying v yeah or yeah well the flying v and the explorer and another guitar called the modern were designed because one of the most important people in the music industry was a guy named Ted McCarty. He ran Gibson in the fifties, late fifties. Mm -hmm. And under his rule, Gibson did the Les Paul, the 335, the Tunematic Bridge, the Humbucking Pickup, the Flying V, the Explorer, whatever. Fender was making solid bodies and Gibson was still known for their, their jazz guitars, their hollow bodies. And so they had come out with the Les Paul and but Fender Leo Fender was still saying that it was stodgy and you know everybody was calling Gibson old man stuff and everything and Gibson said all right so they hired some automobile designers and they designed some futuristic guitars the Flying yeah. V the Explorer and the in the Modern and of course they made 81 Vs they made 19 Explorers and supposedly they made a Modern um, but uh, there are people that, that have seen it but there are no photographs of of the actual guitar a working guitar there's there are photographs from a nam show of a of a body but it doesn't have electronics on it and stuff like that but anyway these guitars were so futuristic um and they they were sales failure um because they were just so drastically different but but ted mccarty had some balls on him and he put those out there and they were these angular futuristic you know space age looking things because space age was what it was all about back then and um those guitars now uh, Rick Nielsen uh, of Cheap Trick has at one point or another, I think owned half of the 19 Explorers and uh, he's got a bunch of V's. I, I used to have a V. Uh, 50s V. Yeah, 50, 59. And um, uh, I've never had an Explorer. I've played it, you know, Rick's guitars and stuff like that and several other people's. And uh, they're, they're magnificent guitars, that, but it was like a joke that nobody got. And nowadays, everybody and their brothers got flying Vs and Explorers and stuff. And, and the cool thing is what was so scary and dangerous and, and, and holy shit about releasing those back then, they're almost, they're almost boring now. But Gibson was a cool company and they were always pushing the envelope. And I love old Gibson stuff. And um, I'm, I'm known for restoring old Gibsons. I, I actually am going to go the other way. Like, a lot of the really pointy weirdo guitars I think are for kids because <laughs> I'm a boomer. But yeah. in other words, in other words, I think there are some classic designs that when I say classic, the definition of classic is it, it is 60 plus years since they were designed and they're still yeah. relevant and they're still and relevant. I, and, and I'm going to say some people are going to say, Oh, I like, I like my pointy Schecters and, and, and they, they can, yeah, that's, that's why they're set 57. Uh, varieties of Baskin Robbins ice cream or whatever it is. <laughs> Baskin Robbins still in business? I think they, yeah, they are. They're with Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, cool. Yes. We should get, we should get sponsors here. No. We absolutely do. Uh, well, like a coffee sponsor. <laughs> a coffee sponsor would be good, but otherwise um, I don't really want sponsors because this is two guys telling the truth. Yeah. But, but you get a sponsor, then you got to, you got to either, lean towards their objective or yeah. lean away from an objective that they would be offended yeah. by. And I don't plan on offending anybody, but I certainly but you don't. reserve the right to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I reserve the right to be offensive at any given time. Exactly. Um, but uh, uh, on the point of guitars, um, I have to say uh, I own, 
I don't own any pointy guitars right now, but I've had like some of the seventies BC riches were awesome guitars, yeah. uh, mockingbirds and Eagles and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I, I, I think I have, I think I might have a flying V somewhere, but it's not anything super remarkable, mm -hmm. but I have customers that own pointy guitars. Yeah. Uh, like my friend Shane Haas makes these amazing heavy metal guitars called death adders and, and what have you. And, and, and his workmanship is, is mm -hmm. unbelievable. And th the people that like those guitars, Hey, God bless them. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I do kind of, I have a wall of, of, of Les Pauls and then I have some new Schecter USAs that are basically built and look just like old guitars. And, uh, um, and I have a, a PRS DGT and you have your, mm -hmm. your custom 24. Um, I favor classic designs myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 you know, you can say what you want about, you know, pointy guitars are for kids. I'm going to disagree with that because there's some fantastic people out there playing guitars that I would not choose to play. Yes. And, and they're making great music with it and they're entertaining mm -hmm. people with it. And, um, you know, like I, I'm not even a Slayer fan, but, there's something to be said for Carrie King in this. Well, Carrie King is a flying V. And uh, isn't he with a, with a uh, pointy headstock? He's got all kinds of weird pointy. Okay, crap. So the stuff, yeah, that just a, my, my particular, yeah, you know, everybody has their thing. My yeah. particular thing is yeah, I like the classic things. And then I like the chairs in the background right now. Those yeah, chairs you have are the coolest, man. Thank you. Facebook marketplace. <laughs> Those are so cool. And today is your day. I don't know if you knew that. Why? Because the sign says so. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, I can't read that because I don't have my glasses on. Yes. Wait, a minute. Wait a minute. Today is my day. Yes. See, I here's an interesting thing. When you can't find your glasses, you, you take a, a, a lanyard. In this case, it was a Paul Reed Smith guitars lanyard. Okay. And you heat shrink it onto the glasses and then you wear them like a librarian. And then yeah. when I need them, they're there. And then when I don't need them, I... Do you ever still lose them? Well, the ones upstairs, yes. No, I'm just saying, do you ever forget that they're there? <laughs> yeah, well, I have two pairs of these and I, I'm wearing the pair I can find. Yeah. Um, but upstairs and like I'm down in the, in the, in the shop, um, but upstairs in the real world, I just have a pair of glasses in just about every room. Yeah. Um, because my eyes are not bad enough to actually wear glasses full time. I just need the readers when I want to yeah. look at something up close. So my saddlebags, I have, I have readers. I, you know, my, my riding jacket, I have a pair of readers. There's probably four or five in the van because I, I buy them all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll drop them under the seat and only paid a dollar 50 for them. I'll buy another pair or I'll buy a 12 pack. Yeah. And uh, you know, the more you have of something, the more you lose. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my legacy will be uh, long after I'm gone. They'll still be finding reading glasses and, 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 and uh, shoe boxes and stuff like that. And Les Paul guitars. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Thank but, you. Uh, to Thank sum you. it up, your band is a business. Treat it as a business, and yes. you will be successful. Yes. Nobody becomes successful without considering how they come across to other people. You are not so important that you can't be nice to other people. Absolutely. That's a that that's the best kind of advice. So I so I, I take back that pointy pointy guitar reference. So. Good man, good man. <laughs> but those all are right. the chairs, man. All right, all right, right at the bench, episode four. Thank you. This is enjoyable. Yep. Thank you, sir, and God bless everybody out there. Uh, I hope everybody has a good day. Yep.